Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is Benjamin Graham with your news. Dairy is going Hollywood. This summer, Dairy will be welcoming filmmakers to the first annual Dairy Public Film Festival, bringing together film fans and the newest stars in independent cinema in our historic Aladdin Theater. The Dairy Film Board is proud to announce the festival's opening film, Frank Darabont's Old Yeller 2, Sometimes They Come Back. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King book club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And Benjamin Graham. Hey there, constant readers. And today we are talking Pet Cemetery movies, the original, the sequel, and the remake. We'll get to the original and the sequel, and we'll, we'll cover the remake later. We're going to go see that in a bit. Uh, so, Ben, it's your last time taking charge of Pet Cemetery. Take it away, buddy. Oh, man, I am going to miss Pet Cemetery. honestly. Weirdly enough, yeah. I have enjoyed this so much, and uh, having watched three Pet Cemetery movies basically back-to-back, <laughs> uh, I'm so immersed in it. Three very different experiences, right, guys? Yes. I oh, will yeah. definitely say that they are very different. We'll start off with the original i had never seen this movie and i can't believe it because holy shit it's so good yay <laughs> <laughs> i'm so happy that you like it because i love it it's so much fun and i've watched it like two or three times now can't get enough of it and it's directed by a woman mm-hmm. too which I promise I'm not going to go on and on and on oh, about movies that are directed by women because women don't get a fair shot in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, how dare we talk about <laughs> <laughs> the grin on your face as you say that? Let, how oh. dare we talk about very true, true things? <laughs> um, no, I did note that and extremely well directed. Yeah. Uh, she did an amazing job and I'm frankly surprised that she hadn't directed more things well she did she directed pet cemetery 2 which two. Uh, might explain yeah. why she hasn't directed Honestly, more yeah, things. that makes more sense <laughs> thinking about it that way <laughs> um this movie is the most uh true to the book movie definitely that we've watched yeah. and maybe that i've ever seen because it nails even the things that it changes don't affect the feeling of the story. Yeah, I, I felt the same way about that. With a, I was very concerned because Norma isn't in the original movie, but we are introduced to the the housekeeper that they have, and that's uh, who ends up dying. And so we, we it, still get that funeral scene that we illustrate that Rachel's so uncomfortable with and everything like that. So we still get all those plot points. We just mm-hmm. get them in a little different way. Uh, going into it, I didn't know how the hell they were going to make a movie out of this book. I'm just amazed by the little boy. Yeah. And yeah. how menacing he was for being a little boy. And I guess I was imagining that it would be something more along the lines of Chucky. So oh God, that is <laughs> that is my largest problem with this movie is when Gage becomes Chucky and can fly at the end of this oh, movie. Okay, well, we that, will get to that. <laughs> we are jumping. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Way way ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the the child actors kind of surprisingly good. Uh, what did you guys think of Zelda? So when I was watching it, I was like, uh, I saw Zelda and I was like, that's 100 percent a man. Immediately, like that's and, definitely and a dude. And uh, there's a, a really cool documentary about how they made Pet Cemetery, which everybody should watch because it's amazing. And that what, they interview called? that guy. It's called the uh, Pet C- Cemetery documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Google it, you'll find it. <laughs> and they interview him, and he talks about being in that role and stuff. And it's just so cool. And it, having seen that, it made me appreciate his weird portrayal of Zelda all it's the more. It was off-putting. super weird. 
Okay, that actually leads to uh, my, my main discussion that I want to hit in the first Pet Cemetery movie. Because honestly, most of it is just going to be me going, holy shit, it was so good. <laughs> what I really want to talk about is the several instances of just real weirdness. It's a real weird movie, guys, and I love it. I, I just want to go around and say, what what is your favor, favorite single bit of the movie? This is going to be a weird choice, mm. but my favorite bit of this movie, like my favorite detail is when they take church to the Micmac burial ground and the way they describe it in the book, when Judd approaches this impassable deadfall and without looking, he just step, step, step gets over it. And they, it's a hundred percent how it works. <laughs> like this thing looks like an impassable wall. And when the actor just walks up, he just, Scales it super casually, like it's no big deal. And I was like, that is exactly how I yeah, imagined and it. It looks it looks unnatural. It looks yeah, it's it looks so very dreamlike, weird, just yeah. like in the book. My favorite part, well, it's a couple parts because it involves a character that we get way more of in the movie than we got in the book. And that was Victor Pascal. Mm -hmm. I really loved what they did with his role. And I think I probably loved it because I love the movie American Werewolf in London. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of that a lot. And I'm wondering if you're going to say the same part that I was thinking of. Well, I just like all of those parts with him. Like mm -hmm. every time he was in a scene, I was like, oh, that's so cool. Um, As far as Pascal, one, one of the parts was when Rachel is she's went to Chicago um, and she's coming back. Ellie has had the dream and. and Rachel knows something is wrong and she's rushing back and there's this one short scene of her trying to rent the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so cool because she's just, it's a shot of the lady behind the desk saying, I'm so sorry. We don't have any cars right now. And then it shows Rachel at the desk looking around worried and Victor standing next to her. And Victor goes, well, how about this car? Th this car looks pretty good. And then the cuts back to the lady behind the desk. And she's like, well, yeah, I guess I guess that car would work. I mean, it's it's a little it's got a scratch or whatever. It was very dream uh, dream like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I loved it. It was just cool how hard he was trying to help her get back. And he even stops the stewardess from closing the door when Rachel's mm -hmm. running to the plane and and you're just like, oh, man, she has a shot. <laughs> it's a really cool, just directional, that directorial choice. Mm -hmm. Here's the, the other thing, though. Like, I love that we get more of Victor Pascal because it the, those bits are great. But it kind of further muddles what is Victor Pascal. The thing with the book is that Lewis has no idea what he's up against. He has no mm -hmm. idea what these forces are. And we as the reader also don't really know like no, nobody comes right out and says this 100% is a Wendigo this is 100% the forces you're going against we never find that out because Lewis never finds that out it's bigger it, than it's, everything yes so Victor Pascal's warning seems like something using him to deliver that with the movie with him being in throughout there's a part of me that's like it's the ghost of one guy who barely knew Lewis against this giant malevolent ancient force like what's what's his stake in the game or is it just a power of good using his spirit like it it just puts that question out there for me a little more the sense that i got from him in the book is that it was just him and his soul was sticking around because lewis tried to help him live and he was repaying that or trying to repay it before he could move on. That makes sense. I guess I just part of me never it never occurred to me that Victor Pascal would know about the Micmac burial ground at all. I mm. just yeah, I assume he knows because I don't know, he's dead and, and it's a otherworldly force. And so that could now be. he yeah. has yeah. yeah access to this knowledge that he wouldn't have. Yeah. You, you just wanted him to be an agent of the white, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's a dark movie. Uh, a yeah. two-year-old gets hit by a semi-truck. That That's scene horrible. is insane. It is so much. Uh, 
I'm going to use the, just the word closer, like <laughs> the way that shot is so tense and so close. It's shot mm-hmm. from Gage's perspective. Yeah. The, the image of the truck coming at him is low like that. Like you are mm-hmm. looking out through Gage's eyes. And I found myself unconsciously as he's running, part of me being like, fall, 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 <laughs> please fall. <laughs> Even though you. Even though I know that's not going to happen. Did you guys notice this is kind of jumping ahead, but later when he's in Judd's house and Rachel finds him and he comes out and he's dressed kind of weird. Oh. He's dressed the same way as the painting in Rachel's parents' house. When she's on the what? phone with Lewis Fuck, no. in the background. Whoa. And I think that's a painting of Zelda because Zelda was also wearing like a blue dress. So she's in the in the foreground and in the background there's this creepy disturbing painting and it's a little girl with like a cane and a blue velvet dress and a top hat fuck that's and gauge that's what he no looks i like. did not notice that although that was going to come because <laughs> that's another insane choice this movie makes and it it shouldn't work and it should be sort of like it should pull you out and kind of make you giggle and it doesn't well it didn't me you giggled well, at everything <laughs> that was what i was leading to when i when i said this movie's dark a uh, two-year-old gets hit by a truck. D- did you guys laugh as many times as I did? When he got hit is- by a truck? No, not at that <laughs> part. <Yeah>. Wow, Ben. <laughs> I'm not wow. a monster. <laughs> at no. what part? Okay, there's a few the, parts I mean, in this Victor movie. Victor Pascal that- has some laugh lines. Like, there's some, like, okay. humorous things he does. Are yeah. you talking about intentional humor or... <laughs> okay, I say yes. Because <laughs> near the end of the movie... It is, Gage is back. He has killed Judd. Okay. Judd's death. Hmm. It's brutal. Not funny at all. I, no, not funny at all. No, this is a divergent <laughs> thought. <laughs> I Fucking iconic. The, the scalpel going through his Achilles tendon. Yeah. That's terrible. I hate that. Yeah, I, I, I like jerked my leg so hard <sighs> when that happened. Stuff like that in movies yeah. is my... Achilles Hill. <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, and c- getting, he cuts through his, his cheeks. Yeah. It's that brutal. was fucking brutal. The makeup oh, for that scene was so upsetting. Awesome. So good. Um, <laughs> Ben's like upsetting. I'm like, awesome. And Josh is like, good. You're all right. <laughs> um, anyway, that I'm all over the place because I love this movie so much. But what I was getting at is, uh, it's after that scene that's such an intense, like, sad, because Judd is so great. Uh, he's so kindly, and mm-hmm. you, you really like this character, and he gets brutally murdered, and then it cuts to Lewis asleep in bed, and he wakes up with a jerk and falls out of bed and slams his head against his bedside I did table. laugh at that. That was that's really good. hysterical. Yeah. Yeah, that was funny. That, that was, was really funny. A great pratfall. And you can't tell me the director wasn't just like, we need some levity. We need to, <laughs> we need to lighten this up. Hit your head real hard. <laughs> the Something that I really enjoyed about it, all of the instances where the trucks just zoom by mm-hmm. before anybody gets hit by them, because Judd is across the street and there's just there are times where they're just standing on one side of the road and they just turn and then truck just tearing down the road just inches from them. And just like it, I jumped every single time, every single time. Did you guys notice the color yellow? No. I mean, I'm sure I saw yellow <laughs> things. So I think the color is the color yellow is used to signify tragedy. Something bad is going to happen. Churches. Cat carrier is yellow. Uh, Missy's dress has yellow flowers on it. When Rachel and Lewis are fighting and she comes out of the house and she's holding Gage, she's wearing a yellow robe. When they're at the picnic, Gage is wearing a yellow jumper. I don't know. I did not notice that. Yeah, it just seemed like the color yellow was sort of this foreboding. Apparently I wasn't paying as close. I I gotta go watch (laughs) this movie again. Shit. And I would. And I would. I totally would. Uh, so good. I never thought that the that we talked. You talked about the pace earlier. That the pace and the overwhelming sense of grief mm-hmm. would translate from book to movie. I never thought that could have happened so well. But I imagine, and this could be just me, uh, that 
I don't know if I would have liked it as much had I not read the book just beforehand, just like like a lot of things. But they did such a great job conveying those emotional scenes. I would completely agree. There are some books that I've read where the book and the movie complement each other Mm -hmm. so well. Um, A Clockwork Orange does this. Yeah. Um, reading the book and the movie, they're both different in significant ways, but they complement each other so much that it makes you like reading the book makes you like the movie more and watching the movie makes you like the book more. I completely agree with you. And I was thinking about this while I was watching and I was kind of reflecting on other movies, on other adaptations, more specifically like Shawshank Mm -hmm. and The Body or Stand By Me. And those were almost too similar, too faithful. For me personally, I liked that this kind of had some different elements that were still very faithful to the source material, but I did things that just worked better on film. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it just doesn't, I, I'm bored by it. Cause I feel like, yeah, I just read this. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. And before we move on to Pet Cemetery 2, which will almost exclusively consist of this question. Did Pet Cemetery 1 have any downsides? Uh, no, not for me. Like, I just... Okay, here's something else. D- Sorry. Disagree. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. The final climactic scene, a dummy gets thrown. Oh, they sorry. throw a my no, buddy. No, you're right. I forgot about <laughs> that. I touched on it earlier. Lewis gets a my buddy thrown at him. Um, it's okay it, though it didn't it, it didn't bother me it, yeah. it really uh, it made me laugh uh <laughs> it, it really did um during the final scene with uh gage which is legitimately terrifying mm-hmm. that they have the kid that plays the kid doing most yes. of yeah most that of the kid's scary as hell scary how as did he fuck. do all of that yeah oh. i'm so impressed so impressed that he he did most of those scenes yeah. holding the scalpel walking towards rachel with the scalpel saying i got you something mom oh. so creepy. goosebumps so terrifying yeah but for the action sequences, it is just <laughs> the worst child mannequin I've ever seen. You know, that kid was so good that I'm surprised he didn't do his own stunts. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was that was probably, yes, that is the thing that I hated about this movie. I completely forgot about it because I was just thinking about all the great things. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't like it when they take something. That is one thing that is a complete divergent path from the book. Like, being resurrected does not give you superpowers and he somehow i don't know jumped into the attic and then flew down <laughs> to attack and like he was stronger it was the than wendigo. he should have been well the he, wendigo he, he gave did him have <laughs> the wendigo powers worldly, yeah. because when lewis walks into judd's house it's all decrepit and like rotting and uh and Lewis walks around, and then as he walks up the stairs, it go- it's gone. It was an illusion. And Gage says, oh, I really scared you, Daddy. And it's like, that that's another really weird choice. <laughs> but I loved it. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. It's uh, It was just a matter of late 80s special effects sure but god anything. the that watching him after he gets injected watching him like stumble away oh, and lean against the wall when not he, fair his little kid face and he like touches his mm-hmm. cheek yeah. yeah and he i it broke it broke my heart when he got hit and it broke my heart when he died again at the end so brutal amazing movie yeah let's real briefly just highlights of Pet Cemetery oh, 2. We, we don't fucking have to go through it. <laughs> can we rate this movie first? Oh, are we doing... Yeah, well, let's do rate our ratings. Rate them right as, as we go. go. Yeah, I think we should. All right. Take it away, uh, Sam. Five out of five blue chambray shirts. Heck yeah. Yeah, to five out of five. I mean, I, I don't think rating's gonna <laughs> take too long. Nope. Five out of five blue chambray shirts. Boom. <laughs> so good. Such a good movie. Uh, Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery 2. two. Let's <laughs> talk about this weird 90s <laughs> bullshit. Uh, now, first I want to say, of course, I did my uh, IMDb research. The lady that directed, um, she came on to direct uh, Pet Cemetery 2. And originally, the plot of Pet Cemetery 2 was supposed to revolve around Ellie, 
That would have been awesome. It was supposed to be would have been the great. story of Ellie and what happened to her after her family died. But instead it was Edward Furlong. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the producers were like, no one wants to watch a movie about a teenage girl. <laughs> And so they made this fucking movie instead. My favorite quote was in an interview, the director said, I wanted to make this movie because I wanted to explore how dumb teenage boys are. Lewis Creed revived Gage because he was sad and he loved his child. But uh, this kid brings back clancy brown because he's a dumbass well, <laughs> i don't even know why he bothered bringing him back because he's immortal what there can be only one <laughs> he was in highlander just oh. move past it <laughs> <Jesus Christ. laughs> just move past it. <laughs> hold on <laughs> highlander pet cemetery crossover they cut off a highlander's head bury him in the pet cemetery infinite quickening well, <laughs> what are, is this anything okay. it's something but, okay yeah we can go with that okay cool. uh anyway this movie edward furlong is some shithead that moves into a town with his vet dad wait 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 no first we have to talk about how this movie opens because i thought it was set way back how or- does it open i can't believe that actually got you <laughs> well it got me because my expectations were very very low got it it, it Honestly, opens on, on the movie set where his mom dies Oh, fuck. Watching this movie was like a fever dream. I <laughs> I remember bits and pieces of it. This movie, I feel like, was like some studio executive was like, you know what? For a movie called Pet Cemetery, only one pet died. I think we should make another one where we kill every pet. Animal body count in this movie <laughs> is staggering. And I, and I hate when animals die. The one thing that I kind of appreciated about it is that... Uh, Edward Furlong. I don't know the character's name. It doesn't matter. His dad is a vet. And I, I just okay, thought that. Yeah, I'm good. All right, cool. That. Well, okay, I'm sorry. I should elaborate. <laughs> because his dad is a vet, we get this additional background information about this town. The previous vet who worked there, he, okay, so I don't even want to talk about the plot. It was but dumb I, as you know, shit. That, that thing with the vet was so it, dumb. So this dog dies. The kids bury it. It comes back and it doesn't come back kind of healed like in the first movie. It's still leaking blood and it's gross. And so the dad takes some blood, sends a sample off um, to probably a bigger office where they can do more testing. And the guy calls him and he's like, what the hell, man? You sent me blood from a dead animal. And the previous vet did that too. What's wrong with you guys, basically? And and then he goes to visit that guy, which gives gave us the best scene in the movie, hands down. He walks in, and now the guy's a taxidermist, and there are all these, you know, animals all over the place, and there's this crow when he walks in, and they have this scene, and the guy is a jerk, and he, like, throws something at him and startles him, and he's leaving. The crow is not a stuffed crow. (laughs) That That was really, really really funny. Uh, We've talked about this longer than we should. We're we're talking about a bunch of nonsense. I'll just, these are the bullet points. Edward Furlong comes to this town. He's bullied by some blonde earringed prick uh, kid. They chase him with his cat, which he brought to school. Well, they they take his cat and they, chase him. They don't chase him with his cat. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been a better movie. You know what I meant. <laughs> uh, goes the, 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 he meets a fat kid and they're friends. And then the uh, dog dies. And then the kid's abusive dad dies and he comes back and uh the fat kid dies in a potato accident (laughs) the potato accident was my favorite it's really the only thing that i wanted to talk about he they (laughs) because the car inexplicably also fills up with potatoes despite the fact that just potatoes should have fallen on the car and not filled the car (laughs) to its brim do you think that there were already potatoes in the car when they (laughs) were We can only yep, hope. Yep. <laughs> Listen, the point they is... They died how they lived, covered in potatoes. <laughs> the point is, the movie's bad, and uh, you should really watch it. What would yeah. you rate it, Ben? Oh, I, I'd give it a solid two. Uh, it's not good, but I recommend watching it. It's pretty, it's pretty bonkers. 
I'm going to say the same that yeah, two two blue chambray shirts because it is bad enough that I wouldn't watch it again anytime soon, but I would watch it with friends. Okay, this is interesting because my two is so my three would be it didn't do anything for me, didn't love it, didn't hate it, kind of neutral. So two is I actively disliked it a little bit and I would not watch it again. So I'd have to rate it two out of two blue chambray shirts. Huh. Two out of two. Two out of two? I'd have to rate it. <laughs> a perfect Sorry, hold score. On, I'm do that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly scored. No, I'm gonna That's leave it. <laughs> That's what this movie did to me. Two out of two. You can't. There's not even an option to give it five. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> it did the best it could do under the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, All right. So, uh, are we ready to to jump into the new Pet Cemetery? Fuck yes. Yeah. Let's go see a movie. Hey everyone, we are back from the theater. We just saw the new Pet Cemetery like 20 minutes ago, however long it took to get back to the studio, and we are excited to jump into this. But before we do, we interviewed some people as they came out of the theater. Let's hear from the fans. Oh, I, my name is Jesse. Hey okay, Jesse, what did you think of <clears throat> Pet Cemetery the remake? Um, I liked it. It, it kind of deviated from the original movie and uh, well, the book itself. But I'm I'm quite happy with the changes they made. I think it, it tells the same story, but just in a unique and fresh way. Were you a fan of the first movie? Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge Stephen King fan. Okay. Period. There's maybe only like one or two of his uh, books that I've never read. What was the most gruesome or terrifying moment for you? It's when sh- she's in the bathtub and he, and she's uh, or he's combing her hair, and it's just a tone of voice when she turned around and says like or whatever it is she says like <laughs> what is it or what's wrong, but it's it's that deep. Like devoid of any emotion, way that she says it really got to me, and that's that's kind of where like the first sign of like th- something isn't right and things are not going to go the way that you wanted them to. There you go. Awesome. Hi, this is Lacey. And what did you think of Pet Cemetery the remake? You know what? I thought it was pretty good. I haven't seen the first one, nor have I read the book. But you're a Stephen King fan. I am definitely a Stephen King fan. I, I was struck by, as I was sitting there in the theater watching it, there's a scene, spoilers ahead, yep. where um, he walks through a doorway into, of course, a totally different place. And I thought, oh, that is such a Stephen King thing. <laughs> Did you have a most terrifying moment? You know, the sounds in, like, just the idea of being in a house and there's sounds happening, like, on the roof, and you have no idea what that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was really scary. Well, thank All you. All right, you're welcome. What did you think? I liked everything up until the little girl got brought back because when she started talking, the the spooky mystery was, was minimal. In the in the original one, when Gage gets brought back, he's more like an animal. Like he can barely talk because he's like not quite two or whatever. I thought that was uh, scarier. What was your creepiest moment? I don't know that it was creepy, but my favorite, like, yeah, moment was when they showed the Wendigo way out in the distance. So, what did you think of Pet Cemetery the remake? Oh man, did it had some like really good. S- startle moments like jump out at you but then like the subtle nods to other Stephen King universe Mm -hmm. things I was really happy with and like the little tiny easter eggs those were cool Um, I think I still prefer the 89 version I mean it was more true to the book Mm -hmm. but I like the way they did this adaptation the actors and actresses were spot on it was creepy super creepy what was your creepiest moment dragging mommy through the woods that was messed up yeah yeah super creepy i was and then the dumb waiter scene i covered my eyes i was like mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. she was laughing did you have a creepiest moment um i'd probably say how aggressive the little girl is oh yeah she was really insane thank you both. you bet all right so that brings us to the end of the original and the sequel so now we're going to talk about the remake strap in let's do this thing (laughs) i am so excited when we left the theater i wanted to just rant to you guys (laughs) i wanted to just i i could not wait i was biting my tongue (laughs) i want to hear you guys impression just overall impressions before i start Okay, so I usually need some time away from a movie after having just watched it to kind of process and 
Because my initial, like my knee-jerk reaction, if it's something, if it's a source that I love and I'm familiar with, is to love it. And that is my knee-jerk reaction. I really enjoyed it. I thought that it was fun. They did change some things, which we will get into. It, I was okay with the changes. They did not and maybe it's because I had just watched the original. Mm-hmm. It didn't take anything away from the book or the original movie for me. Like those, I can still hold sacred. It did not, some movies just take a huge dump all over the thing you love. <laughs> this one did not do that. Um, there were, and we'll get to this too. I don't want to spoil it yet. There were some scenes that really got me hard. And I. We, ben, sorry, what? Ben, Weird oh, phrase. <laughs> I had a Real raging boner the phrase. whole movie. I'm not taking it back. <laughs> anyway, that when we were interviewing people after the movie, I was asking, you know, what was the creepiest moment? And people were sharing. Nobody shared the thing that I thought everybody would be talking about that was insane. So let's, Josh, what do you think about it? And then let's get into <laughs> yeah. it. All right. Um, I, I, I feel right now, I feel very indifferent towards this movie uh i watched it i was a part of watching it the (laughs) changes were a little weird like some of it was a little distracting uh i i kind of came around to understanding a little bit of why some of the stuff was different i was not as engaged as i wanted to be and that's kind of where i'm at right now I'm hoping that the more the more we talk about it, that we'll hit on some things that'll mm-hmm. make me that'll impact my feeling one way or the other. Ooh. But right now, I'm like Ooh. right down the middle. <laughs> I'm so excited because um, I completely agree with CM that my favorite part of going to see a movie is when I can walk away and I'm still thinking about it. Mm-hmm. I'm still processing my some of my favorite movies are movies that I saw the first time and went. Did I like that? <laughs> and then yeah. a few days later, I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. I go, oh, I, I didn't. I loved that. This isn't that movie. <laughs> uh, and now this is a contest between me and CM to get Josh on our oh, show. Oh, shit. And I am very excited about <laughs> it. All right. So let's let's get into it. I will be the first to say right off the bat, I was fucking in. I was excited. It starts off promising it does that thing where it shows you the end shows Mm -hmm. you this this terrifying tragic moment and then you come back so we open on this scenic view this aerial view of ludlow and then we see this house on fire and then we zoom in and we come to this other house and there's a car and the doors open and there's bloody handprints on the window and we're going up to the house and there's footprints and there's blood like something has been dragged either in or outside of the house. And then we start the movie. Me. The Creeds coming to their new home. I Right off the bat, I loved that. I was real stoked about that beginning. And it, it starts out really well. We, we get uh, what we know, them driving up to the house, um, the chemistry behind the with the family members uh, between the creeds is really good they i felt I, like a real family i yeah. liked lewis uh i like and rachel ellie is a little the actress playing ellie is a little older mm-hmm. than uh than in the first movie and i think in the books and it diverges pretty quick very quick judd doesn't even show up for a, a decent amount of time. And then he only shows up to Ellie, which I thought was weird. I thought that was a weird choice I'm to make that relationship the strong one. I Okay. <laughs> we got to come back to that relationship mm-hmm. because I understand why they did that. And I loved that they did that because of what happens later. Well, let, let's talk about, uh, I want to talk about Judd right I, now. Is that why you guys either didn't like or were indifferent? Because that that relationship was important and I didn't like that we didn't have that like fatherly best friend relationship between Lewis and Judd. Lewis was mm-hmm. I thought kind of an ass to him mm-hmm. and some like his tone and just the way he talked to him was kind of shitty. It, it was definitely a part of it. Um li- I love John Lithgow as yeah. much as anything. He can do amazing. no wrong. He is so great but he's not judd in this there's 
Judd in the book and the original movie is kind hearted and just you instantly care about this character. And in this, he's kind of a creepo. Like, right? Well, he's more realistic, like what he would be if he lived in this area, had this influence hanging over his head, had buried his dog and his dog came back from the dead. And then as we later find out, went after his mom. So his dad had to kill it again. He's got a he's got some baggage. Well, this is also a Judd that has lived alone for a time longer than we're aware because Norma's dead. You can't at the ever start. get Norma in a damn never get a Norma. cemetery movie. Yeah, I, well, I guess that is a part of it because they've they've changed his backstory, and I mean that's the underlying problem of this whole movie is they've changed how the pet cemetery works. I feel like okay in the book. Um, the pet cemetery is mysterious. We don't know how it works. Um, in the past, every animal that we know of, Judd said, you know, there's only been one that came back bad. Henratty the bull. Oh, you're talking about the Micmac burial ground. Not yeah, the yeah, yes. Cemetery. Uh, semantics. Um, <laughs> they're, they're different, though, because they, when they the kids are. bury their pets in the pet cemetery, yes. they don't all come back. That would yes. be horrible. <laughs> um, but all the animals that came back, like most of them just come back. They come back wrong, but mm-hmm. not bad. In this movie, he says, like, when I buried my dog, it came back bad. It attacked my mom and my dad had to kill it. Yeah. And... Like, it really, they try to justify it saying, oh, I thought because um, church was nice to begin with that it would come back nice. And it it just doesn't ring true, you know? But I I disagree with that because I bought that because the, the book is trying to convey this immense power that this land has over people and has over their actions. And otherwise, good people who would not make these really terrible decisions Mm. And so to to be faced with the truth of that, like, yeah, this is a terrible thing. It's bad. I I knew that and I knew it would probably not go well. But the power over me is so great that I lied to myself and I said, this is going to be different because church was a good cat. Mm. And that I, I prefer the way they did it in the book to this, but it didn't um, I didn't dislike it or disagree with it. I just thought. Okay, the, it's more, it's a darker take on it. It's not, we don't get that more wholesome family connection between the two and the wholesomeness of Judd. Like I said, he's had, he's had a hard time and, and he just doesn't have that thing that makes him Judd. So I agree with that, but it made sense to me. I just feel like we didn't, we, we didn't earn enough of the relationship between Judd and Lewis for that, that journey. Yeah. Like, there just wasn't enough there for me. And it's it's not the only thing that there's, that's a great way to put it, there's not enough there. And what do you, like, do you mean why Lewis would follow Judd to the burial ground? Why Judd would take him to the burial ground. But that ground. goes back to the influence. I guess, yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense, having read the book and knowing the history. But, like, I, I'm trying to think of the book, or this movie, rather. As if I had went into it without knowing anything, without having seen the other movie, without having read the book. Maybe I would have liked it better. Maybe. I, I, I don't know. Um, all I know is just the, the, the connections and the reasoning behind why everyone does everything just doesn't feel as real and natural. Um, mm-hmm. It feels more like, oh, this is happening because it's the next thing that happens. For example, when Church dies, there we do not get the 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 reason that Lewis brings him back as much, I don't think. He he's doing it because he thinks it's the right thing to do and in this movie it it felt more like what when they have this fight or Rachel, oh he tells Rachel first of all that Church is dead. Yeah, which bothered me because the whole uh a man's heart is stonier well that's thrown out the window that doesn't mean anything anymore because that means you know a man's heart is stonier because he keeps his secrets he he uh 
does what he has to do, even if it's kind of shitty. But she she was right there, though. Like, it, it makes sense in the in the book and the other in the original movie. He they were in Chicago. Right. So and it was easier to lie. It would have it would have stood out and not made any sense. His wife right there, they're in the home and he doesn't say that. Unless unless when they got back, they had the conversation that they have in the book and in the first movie of like, mm-hmm. hey, don't tell anybody that he's dead. Yeah. Well, like, I, and and that's like because they don't have a relationship that earns that moment. Mm-hmm. There's no reason I, I I get about the initial trip where they're in the pet cemetery and they're going to just bury him rightly, and then he's so close that it kind of mm-hmm. yeah. takes him. They don't have a close enough relationship for him to have that that fatherly like, hey, let's keep this between us for right yeah. now. And I, Lewis Lewis walks away from that experience feeling like he shouldn't say anything, even if he doesn't completely understand why. I think they traded his relationship with Judd for his re- Judd's relationship with Ellie. Because he does this for Ellie specifically. Sure. In, in the book, Lewis does it for Ellie. In the mm-hmm. movie, the remake, Judd does it for Ellie, which is interesting. Yeah, I guess that makes that makes sense. And yeah, I, I'm not saying that anything in the movie doesn't make sense within the context of the movie. It's just... I guess I I am <laughs> uh, doing some self reflection, being that asshole. It's like the book was better. <laughs> I liked it when they did it in the book. Okay, uh, can uh, I'm gonna there there are some major things mm-hmm. that this does differently. We've touched on one of them. I'd like to touch on another before we get to like the crazy main one. Yes, I don't know. I think this thing that you're about to bring up might be the real crazy thing. Is it Zelda dying in a dumbwaiter? Ben and I started laughing and then had to hold ourselves in because that's the dumbest thing it in this movie. It was the <laughs> worst. Zelda's death scene in the dumbwaiter <laughs> was terrifying <laughs> and tragic <laughs> and impactful. It was and horrible. It was none of those things. And I cannot it was, believe it was a cheap, it, it was, was a cheap jump scare. It was impactful they, in that she impacted the top of a dumb one. Boom, she did. She okay. <laughs> so, Walk us through <laughs> this nonsense, please. Okay, so Church dies and Lewis and Rachel are having that fight and Rachel's begging him not to tell Ellie that Church is dead. She's like just tell her that he ran away, please. And he's like, no, we got to, we, you know, we got to confront this. And he confronts her again about Zelda. He's like, is this because of your sister? And she's like, yeah. And she starts, this is when we get that reveal of what happened. I thought it was very effective the way, and they keep doing this throughout the movie. They cut as she's talking. She's, it's like she has PTSD, but we really, really see that. Yeah. Like I've never seen it done so well. That feeling. That was good. It I was liked just, that. Yeah, because it was just like a cutaway scene in the original movie, but in this, it keeps flashing back and it's intruding in the audience's faces like it's intruding in her mind. Yeah. And so she's, we're seeing her, you know, talking about her sister. And one day she was going to bring her food and she was alone with her and she didn't want to go upstairs and they had this dumbwaiter. So it didn't always work, and she knew that, but she's you know terrified of Zelda. So she puts it in the dumbwaiter, pushes the button. <laughs> if you guys laugh while I'm talking about this. <laughs> she sends it up, and she hears these horrible sounds of Zelda making her way yeah. somehow. It's I don't know gross. if she's crawling, because I don't think she can walk, to where the dumbwaiter must be in her room. And then we hear all these strange noises and a crash, and Rachel opens the dumbwaiter and her sister's crumpled body is in the dumbwaiter. No. He opens it and all of the contents of the dumbwaiter are all jambled. And then she's like, oh, and then the ceiling caves in and her body shows up, which is why it's oh, yeah. a cheap ass jump scare. And that's my, that is my problem with and this movie. just so dumb. <laughs> okay. Her, her sister cannot get out of bed. How did she get up and fall down a fucking dumbwaiter? That's <laughs> The stupidest thing. And throughout the movie, uh, and this is another major problem I have with the movie, is the original and the book are emotional uh, explorations of grief. Yes. They are a horror novel and movie uh, by associate, like, secondarily. Mostly it is a novel about grief. 
and this remake is a shitty modern blockbuster horror movie. It had, yeah, those moments. And I, I'm not into those moments yeah, in modern horror. Throughout the, the movie, there are these scenes of Rachel. There's uh, this scene, I forget what fucking Lewis is doing, but Rachel is alone in her bedroom and she starts hearing these thumping noises above her and it doesn't look like they even have an attic. They're coming from the roof or something. Mm-hmm. And she follows them into the bathroom and she's looking in the mirror and she opens the medicine cabinet and it's the shaft of a dumb waiter looks in it and looks up and then a body falls at her and the yeah. mirror slams and it opens and it's nothing. Visually, well, she's, it's a dream cool. too. Or no, yeah. that's different. No, that's a different. Yeah, yeah. that's later. But it, it's so, this movie got really hung see, up on the Zelda. Like for, they, they took that very like the one of the most frightening images of the first movie and they spent 20 minutes on it. And that's not what the story, the story is not about Zelda. I, I, get, I liked it. <laughs> I thought it was it, effective. It looked cool. It sure, it uh, sure did look cool. It's well, every time, the- you know what? I'm sorry. The first movie was more about Lewis and his wiener buddy, Judd and his son gauge. And now it's all about Rachel, Zelda and Ellie. I liked it. Okay. That is an interesting are- perspective though. <laughs> Can, should we talk about the big thing now? Yeah. And okay, that makes it sound like I did not like this movie because it is about <laughs> Ellie. She I'm, Ben you sexist. I Listen, I'm not this saying This is not that... a uh pet cemetery <laughs> gate. Uh, this is <laughs> No, and I I'm not trying to imply that or say that. I'm saying I guess as as a woman I could connect with those characters more because I see a lot of dudes doing stuff in most of the movies I watch. Fair. And it was just nice to get more of that relationship with Rachel and Zelda. They did it in a creepy and disturbing way. And then, of course, the thing with Ellie. Yeah. I, I just thought the image of a, a crumpled body falling down a dumb waiter looked it, pretty I, I give you that. It was stupid. <laughs> if she heard the crash, like, why did Zelda fall later? Was she stuck and then <laughs> came loose? I don't uh, know. Who knows? Anyway, yes, the big change. Ellie dies. Ellie instead of Gage. Fucking twist. So crazy. Which I totally saw coming. Yes. I did not. No? I had I had heard that there was a twist, and mm-hmm. I didn't watch any previews or anything about it, so I didn't know what it was. But because I heard there was a twist, I assumed that that would be the twist. Mm-hmm. Although they they kind of try to fake you out with it because you think that you, first mm-hmm. you think it's going to be Ellie, and then you're like, oh no, wait, it is going to be Age, and then you think, shit, it's going to be both, and then it's just yeah. Ellie. Ellie runs out into the into the road because. Um, church uh lewis had run church out of the house and left him out in the woods and he comes home in in the middle of ellie's birthday party and ellie runs out into the road and this truck is coming and then gage comes out and yeah you you don't know what's gonna happen and then the truck swerves around gage and the trailer comes loose and the trailer uh runs ellie down it's tragic because you see Lewis, like he sees Gage and his fear is for Gage and you see him running towards him and you're like, oh man, he's not going to make it because he hasn't ever made it. He didn't make it in the book. He didn't make it in the original and he makes it. And then you're like, fuck, Ellie's a goner and she sees it coming. And then he's, he's walking across, you know, after he puts Gage down, he's walking the length of the trailer and Rachel kind of falls into view and she's just laying there, and then he picks Ellie up and cradles her body, and then we cut to the funeral. Um, this is gonna sound like I'm a monster, <laughs> but this whole movie, uh, another issue I had is it just reeked of bored, you know, bored members somewhere being like, okay, we're making the new pet cemetery. Ooh, you're gonna kill a two year old? We can't do that. We can't we can't show a two year old getting hit by a truck. Uh, yeah, hit the other kid. Oh, she's <laughs> six. No, you got to cast an older actress there. <laughs> OK, I didn't get that at all. I assumed that they made that change because they wanted to make a different movie, but they wanted to be true to the source material. So they didn't want to make it the same beat for beat. What can they change? They can make it Ellie, which is, I think, why we get that relationship that is built up between Ellie and Judd more 
Which I liked that moment where Judd breaks down and he's just like, she's the first person to touch my heart. And, and I can't remember how long. And I just wanted to do this for her. Mm-hmm. And like you can see Judd torturing himself over the decision he made. And it makes more sense why he made that decision with Church. Right. Initially. Because Ellie, like I didn't realize Ellie okay. had touched his heart until that scene where he says it. So then I, I was reflecting as like, okay, that's why Church Okay, and it made it made more make more sense to me, kind of in mm. retrospect. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. So from there, we we cut to Ellie's uh, funeral, and there's uh, actually a really cool moment that I liked is over the casket, just the glare between Lewis and Judd. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's just a look that Judd gives him that was very <laughs> cool. It was. Three seconds long, but mm-hmm. it was it was a cool uh, moment. After we have all this, uh, another thing that this kind of missed out on is there's no, they completely eliminated the relationship between uh, Lewis and his in-laws, which. Mm-hmm. W- that was and, fine. Yeah, yeah we, didn't we, didn't, that. we didn't need to spend the time on it, and it's fine. We just spent more of that time on Zelda flashbacks, but they do get Gage and her in the car and take them off. And this is another change that I thought was interesting. Instead of. In the book and in the original, we have that it's like this force, the force of the Wendigo mm. of the Micmac burial ground. Which, uh, so happy that they actually mentioned yes, the Wendigo. Mm-hmm. That was a cool addition, seeing the Wendigo and kind of getting the idea when they're out in Little God Swamp yeah. that you kind of you can you kind can of see, see like the silhouette yeah. or something. Yeah. You can't that quite tell rad. what you see. That was that, that was, was really cool. really cool. I could have done with more of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> for sure. Could have spent a lot of time in the forest. Hell yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, when they're walking I just want a Wendigo swamp, movie, <laughs> and they see that the the bones, you the camera shows the bones mm-hmm. they're walking on. Oh, Fucking that cool. was cool. All of that stuff with Little God Swamp and yes. the trip to the burial ground was pretty awesome. Uh, but he instead of the evil force making Judd fall asleep, taking him out of it, Lewis actually drugs Judd. To make him sleep, and then he 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 does what he has to do. He goes and he digs up Ellie, buries her. Which that burial was really fucking sad. I feel like the force, that evil force, was making him drug Judd. Okay, because he's a doctor, he has a Hippocratic oath, and sure. we know what we know about him is that he's a good doctor. I cannot imagine a scenario in which he would be comfortable doing that. I think that was the mm-hmm. influence, like he's he's sort of setting aside his ethics like probably part also a grieving father but and we see the like a visually on lewis him losing his fucking mind yeah yes. that guy did I, an amazing job i would agree with that completely um although i would argue that lewis is a good doctor in this movie because we skipped over uh pascal's death when pascal comes in the makeup and the gore on super good so good <laughs> lewis uh, starts doing CPR, and um, well, I, I I thought in the book it, it's it felt so real that when he sees the kid, he knows that kid's dead. Mm-hmm. He he, there is nothing we can do about it. And in this movie, he's like going through all the procedure, the procedure, that you would do. Yeah. and which fair. But it really felt when he started doing CPR and literally there is blood spurting out of his skull and pooling on the ground. I was like, really, man? Like, <laughs> I don't think that's necessary. Oh, he just didn't want to lose him. Well, he's probably got to fill out some insurance uh, thing that says I did CPR. And then also <laughs> at the end of the movie when he finds Judd's dead body, he checks his pulse. Uh, which like, come on, man. Anyway, continue with whatever we were talking about. <laughs> okay, so now Ellie is back. She goes and she kills Judd, which I wish we had the time to get into. But let's just gloss over that for right now. She's creepy. Too. She's super she does creepy. A good job. She she turns her face into Norma's face. It's super creepy. Okay, actually, I have problems with this. We've never we haven't seen all we see, see is an old picture of Norma. But then her face changes into who we're supposed to assume is Norma's face, but we've never seen old Norma. We don't need to recognize so, that. Judd recognizes uh, it, and that's what counts. So, it's, it's so bad, though. Oh, it's I bought it. Dumb. Uh, also, when Judd, uh, there's this, like, scare uh, shot 
of Judd's ankles when he hears noises upstairs. And yeah. He's looking for Ellie. And you keep seeing this shot of his ankles as he walks by the bed. And then he kicks the bed out of the way and there's nothing there. And it's all just like, suppo- it would mean nothing except it's a callback to the original yeah, movie. Yeah, it's an homage it's to that original scene. No, but it does. I mean, Pointless. we all know that something's going to reach out from under any of our beds at any <laughs> given <laughs> day Anytime. and slice our ankles. Like, you guys don't have that fear every no, time you go into your room? Uh, not so much my room, but uh, my car. Every time I get into <laughs> yeah, my car. I do yeah. that, too. I pull I, my legs up quick. That does really So I, I didn't think that was cheap. I actually kind of cheered in my head a little bit. When he kicked the bed, I was like, yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it felt like uh, fan service. and nah. Yeah, but, but I like it's that. It's maybe horror movie fan service. Yeah. Yeah. Which anyway, I appreciate. <laughs> anyway, that's that's I just had to get those <laughs> thoughts out. Any, uh, Gage and Rachel make it back to the house and they see Ellie like brought back. And that scene where Ellie hugs her mom and her mom's arms are like out and she's like, I can't touch yeah. her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was heartbreaking. That was rough. That was a really very well done scene. Mm-hmm. Once I will give the actress that plays Ellie. When she comes back, she is fucking creepy. She is like a different person than the character. The the look on her face, Mm -hmm. she has this like one eye is half lidded and just the expressions. Yeah. Yeah. Different different person completely is so good. But essentially, uh, Ellie wants to make everybody like her. So she's going to kill the family. (laughs) That's her game plan, it sounds like. Uh, and the the scene where she kills Rachel Ugh. is just like, and she's just laying there next to her that, with the knife inside her, just like twisting it while minute. she's talking to her. Can, can we talk about what Rachel did right before Ellie stabs her again? Through Gage at the window? Yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> I forgot about that. No, I, you guys probably think it's stupid, but I loved it. I thought, I thought it was that was so awesome. Cool yeah, I thought that was really cool. Because it shows that desperation and you're watching horror movies and you're thinking, well, I would do this and I would do that. And I, yeah, I would like lower my kid out a window to save his life yep. to drop into his father's arms. And you see her, you know, bust in the window open with a chair and Ellie's trying to break through because she shoves something against the door. And Lewis, thank God, is like just coming home at that point. And she's like, Lewis, get the baby. And she's dangling Gage from the second story window. And he's like, uh, holy crap and she <laughs> drops him and he catches Gage and as Gage falls into his arms we cut back to Rachel and Ellie and Ellie stabs her in the back which all the stuff we've got with Zelda and the flashbacks mm-hmm. and the dreams Rachel has had was more impactful because she stabs her in the spine and then we find out what that dragging blood pile was from because Ellie drags yeah she knocks the, Lewis out knocks Lewis out with a chair <laughs> chair shot to the back the wind, Wendigo power the Wendigo <laughs> power and then somehow in that uh, in just that time gets her mom all the way to the burial ground buries her and then gets back to the house then uh, Lewis puts Gage in the car and tells his two year old don't open this door <laughs> for anybody but me you hear me <laughs> and then goes to uh, to the pet cemetery where he has a fight with his child, which that fight was like, I, I was half in and half out the whole no. time. There, there's I a couldn't. moment though, where when they're fighting and he, he's knocked Ellie down and he grabs the shovel. Mm-hmm. And I thought he was going to like baseball swinger with a shovel. And in my head, I was like, if he hits her with a shovel, I'm going to call that the Mac paddy whack. <laughs> 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 that was that was all I, that's all I could think of. And then he was like boring and was gonna chop her head off. You only said that because you want a episode title. <laughs> and I think we got it. Boo. I actually liked their fight because she they did something with her the camera work and it, she was like seemed kind of supernatural at moments. Yeah. So you could understand she more was like flailing. how she could have like a knockdown drag out with a full grown man. It, and then she completely drops it and is like, no dad, it's me, Ellie for just a second. And I he's not buying it. Could th- This was one of my, this was the part that I was like, I was, I have been pretty negative. I really tried to like this movie guys. I really honest to God did. And this part was the most, th- this was the part that was just like, 
the corporate oh well this is a we're spending a lot of movie and money on this movie there has to be a big fight at the end the 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 book uh, there's a little bit of a fight in the movie but the book the ending with gage is so fast and there's no struggle it's just Mm -hmm. tragic Mm -hmm. it is sad and introspective and just heartbreaking but this is obviously a studio head somewhere. It's like, where's that new uh, horror movie? What? You're, you're going to make a horror movie and not have a big fight with the monster at the end? <laughs> I don't care if the monster's a nine-year-old girl. He's got to fight her. I, <laughs> I hated it. And then just before he's going to chop Ellie's head off, skewered through the back. This was interesting. <laughs> and, and Rachel's standing there holding one of the crosses. And then they both just each grab a hand and just start dragging Lewis I, back to the pet cemetery. I, and that moment <laughs> I was like, fuck yeah. All right. What I thought was cool and well done was first when Ellie was dragging Lewis to the pet cemetery, just seeing that little girl drag him and her hair is hanging in her face and it's foggy and dark, thought the shot was beautiful. That shot was pretty kick ass. Then when she and Rachel, without saying a word to each other, they just grab him and they start dragging him. It was like, just this sweet mom-daughter moment. <laughs> it's, I did, as soon as the movie ended, uh, I did turn to Josh and say, well, at least this one had a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, the was. very end of the movie is we go back to Gage, who has been sleeping in the car. And it's now the, the sun has come up and we get the shot from the beginning of the movie of flying over the woods and we see Judd's house burning. And it zooms into the car and Gage gets up in time to see zombie Lewis, Rachel and Ellie coming out of the woods with a gas can. And uh, Church jumps up on the hood of the car and they're just a big, happy family. And that's that's the end of the movie. I want to see the second movie where the Creeds are just a zombie family. <laughs> <laughs> taking, taking over the town the of Ludlow zombie... like Salem's Lot. No, man. They went to Disney, remember? <laughs> <laughs> they started a new life in Disneyland. Uh, okay. okay, so we're going to have very different ratings. I did not like this movie, if you guys couldn't tell. But I also... It was serviceable. If you have not read the book or seen the original or if you just want a like popcorn movie and to not way overthink it like i do every movie (laughs) i see it works it's okay it's just i wanted to love it i wanted to love it guys and it wouldn't let me (laughs) it's better than pet cemetery too so <laughs> i've got i'll give it right in the middle a three out of five blue chambray shirts of course Sam? see no cm you okay. gotta you gotta All go right. first because this is our contest to to drag josh to our side <laughs> four out of five blue chambray shirts all right that's we no <laughs> no fanfare just <laughs> this is very funny to me that we both had such different reactions and yet we both rated it pretty well (laughs) (laughs) and and i'm not giving it five because um i i gave the original movie five Mm -hmm. and i stand by that rating and i i liked this one and i liked seeing kind of an updated version i am still processing it so i don't know i don't think that i liked it better than the original at this point but i'm a horror movie sucker i love everything horror movie i've watched a lot of horror movies that aren't you know, quote unquote good. Mm -hmm. And I um, can find so many things to appreciate about them. So I'm much more forgiving of horror movies than other viewers might be. So you're like my dad with superhero movies. (laughs) (laughs) My dad's like Green Lantern was pretty good. What are you talking about? (laughs) Oh my God. It's just, there's something about horror movies, even if they're not great, they're so easy to just get into. You're along for the ride. You're enjoying yourself. And then, yeah, I'd watch it again. Man, I, I, I've I went back and forth while we were talking about this. <laughs> still, several times. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna give it a three out of five blue chambray shirts because for me it is it is right down the middle of the road at least right now the way I'm thinking about it. I don't plan on seeing it again anytime soon, but I could see myself 
watching it again or like watching it with someone else. Uh, I like that it is kind of an alternate universe version of the story. There's enough similar that I'm like, oh, I see where where they got that from. And there's enough different to be telling a completely different story. That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you so much for listening. Join us next time as we will be taking on part one of The Running Man. I am so jazzed about this. Uh, This was the book selection brought to us by Phil Thiessen. So, Phil, I hope you like this upcoming book. As a matter of fact, I hope we like this book. So if you're going to read along, uh, we are reading to, uh, oddly, the chapter minus 53 and counting. Uh, So join us next time for Benjamin Graham and CM Alexander. I'm Joshua Kahn reminding you, sometimes dead is better. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thanks for listening to part four of Pet Cemetery. This episode is brought to you by our friends, the $1 Producer Project. This is an artist fund whose purpose is to give creators more opportunities without shouldering the financial burden alone. For only a dollar a month, you can help produce up-and-coming artists' live shows, art shows, films, and so much more. Find the $1 Producer Project on Patreon. And please check us out on Patreon. We have an awesome enamel pin of our bloody microphone that you can get by subscribing to one of our tiers. We also have t-shirts, but we can't make them until we get a minimum order of 12, because apparently those things cost money, and we want to give you the softest, most comfortable DPR shirts. By the way, the name of that documentary is Unearthed and Untold, The Path to Pet Cemetery. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check it out. It is awesome. And we can't wait to hear what you guys thought of the remake of Pet Cemetery. We had a lot of opinions on it, all different opinions, in fact, and we want to know yours. Tell us on our Facebook or Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public. If you'd rather share your opinion privately, you can email us at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.